I pray right now this morning, God, Lord, that you would decrease me, that your Holy Spirit increases, God. Father, I pray, O oh God, that the word that you allow me to bring forth this morning is relevant, O oh God, to today, O oh God. And that is what the house needs today, O oh God. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God say, Amen. 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 You may be seated. You may be seated. Amen. First, giving honor to God. Our pastors in their absence, our assistant pastors, our elders, ministers, family members. It's indeed a pleasure to stand before you today. I don't take this lightly. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you would turn to Luke 12th chapter and the 40th verse, and when you find it, say amen. Luke 12, 40. Amen. Still looking, say, wait a minute. Amen. 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 And I dare not forget my most beautiful wife sitting on the front row with me. Amen. My help meet. My rib. Amen. Amen. And my kids. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I know my daughter, she'd be talking trash to me when I get home if I didn't say my children. Amen. But, so we do, do we have it? Luke 1240. And the Bible reads, be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Again, be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. The Bible says no man knows the hour or the time that the Son of Man is coming, but we need to be ready. And I'd like to use for a topic, a text, a message this morning. Will you be ready for the next move of God? Will you be ready for the next move of God? We can personalize it a little more as a church. We can say, will we be ready for the next move of God? And we can look at it on an individual basis. Will I be ready for the next move of God? For you see, I, I believe it's easy if Jesus were to come in back on a Sunday. Because we'd be in position. We'd be in church. The saints would be ready. Amen. Amen. But what if God came to your house? What if God came to your job? What if God came to your place of business? What if God came and you were at a game? What if God came when you were riding in your car? What if God came when you, at, when you were at the grocery store, ready to leave, standing in the 20 items or less line? Somebody got 30 items, you ready to go. Yeah, that happened to me too. You ready to go when they got 30 items. If you were in your car and somebody cut you off only to turn at the, at the very next turn. Yeah, that happened to me too. Mm. For my youth, what if you were at school hanging out with your friends? I know peer pressure is a challenge sometimes. It's, it's a challenge for you and it's a challenge for us as adults sometimes. But what if you were at school? Would you be ready for the next move of God, if God showed up. My other thing is I was studying that God gave me was that what if God came on a Monday versus a Sunday? What if it came on a Tuesday? What if 
they came on a Wednesday before Bible study? What if they came on a Thursday? What if they came on a Friday? What if they came on a Saturday? Would you be ready? There are two things that God gave me. One, he gave me extensive data. The other, he didn't give me much on. The first thing was that we got to be in position. And when he said position, I said, okay, God, let me go look this up. So I, I, I Googled it on my phone. I'm high tech now, ain't I? Back in the days, I would have said I had to go to my Webster dictionary, but I Googled it on my phone. And when I looked it up, the definition of position was condition with reference to place, a location. Number two was a place occupied or to be occupied, site. The third definition was the proper appropriate or usual place, position. And I probably would have never chosen any of those three. But the proper, appropriate, or unusual position. And as I studied, I took a journey in my mind. And the first thing I thought of was assuming the position. And the first thing that I thought of in assuming the position was somebody being arrested. Assuming the position. You know, the cops have them spread out, whatnot. And the thing that came to my mind was that when the officer does that, what he's doing is making sure he has a clear view of what's going on. He wants to make sure that the suspect, he can pat down and he can make sure that he will not, the officer will not be in any harm's way. He's clearing himself so that he can do what he needs to do as far as the arrest. The other thing that he gave me, and I was trying to figure out, God, why are you giving, why are you giving me this? Because, you know, I love sports, but, you know, I'm not really a, a, a sports scholar. I can talk on surface, but when it's time to go deep, you know, I can't do that because I'm not, I've never really been into sports like that. But the second journey he took me in my mind was with a linebacker. The linebacker on the field has to know how to stand, and we're talking about position. He has to know how to move, and he has to have the ability to stop the run. I had to Google that too, y'all. But the thing that, that stayed with me is that he has to know how to stand because it doesn't matter how big he is, doesn't matter how, how, how fast he is, if he's not in the right position, he can't stop the play or he can't stop his opponent. So he has to be in position. He has to be a student of the game. The other thing that I was thinking of in my journey, in my mind, last week, my wife was in a wedding and they had a hairdresser that was coming from out of town. She had expected to do two people's hair that day, excuse me, that night, because the wedding was Saturday. She had expected to do the bride's hair and she had expected to do my wife's hair. But there were about four or five more people who needed to get their hair done. My wife got back in about a quarter after two in the morning, Saturday morning, getting her hair done. But in my journey, as I, as I was thinking about this and what the Lord shows me was that even the hairdresser had to be in position because she expected to do two people's hair, but she ended up doing five or six people's hair. She had to, she had to plan so she would have enough equipment that she could do what needed to be done. She had to schedule the time and have the timing on a moment's notice so she could say, okay, you're, 
you're going to do this. You need to be here. You need to be here. You need to be here. By this time, you need to be here by this time. But not only that, she had to be finessed in what she was doing so she would even understand, well, if I have to do braids, I need to do this. If I need to wash hair, I need to do this. If I need to uh, do a jerry curl, I'm going way back. I need to do this. If I need to do a cut, I need to do this. If I need to do a sew-in, I need to... So she, so she had to... She had to put in order what needed to be done so she could take care of the needs of everybody in the pouring that needed assistance. And God brought me to Paul, Philippians 4. Paul said, with whatever state I am, I've learned to be content. Whatever state, Paul understood how to be with the kings but then he also understood what it was to be with the average person Paul understood how to be rich or live a rich life but Paul also understood what it was to lack Paul understood what it was to be hungry but he also understood what it meant to be full Paul understood what it was to be healed, but then Paul also understood what it meant to be sick. And as you go down into the the 13th verse, Paul says, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Doesn't matter what his situation was, didn't matter what Paul was going through, but Paul said, For he could do all things through Christ, not depending on him own self, his own self, but the strength that he gained through Jesus Christ. In the 19th verse, he says, for God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. Will you be ready for the next move of God in your lack In your richness, in your sickness, in your healing, regardless if you have or you don't have, who are you trusting? Will you be ready for the next move of God? Go with me to Luke 12. Down to the 31st verse. And the scripture reads, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for the master to return from the wedding. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. He himself will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. Amen? Go back to the 31st. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you are waiting for the master to return from the wedding feast. Which takes me back to Matthew 25, 113. There were 10 virgins. There were five that were foolish and five that were wise. The Bible says that the one that were wise bought extra oil for the lamp as they were waiting for the bridegroom. But the five foolish did not. And they had expected him at a certain time, but he was running late. So they went to sleep. And my Bible says that they heard someone said, the bridegroom is here. He's ready. And as they awoke and began to prepare, the five that were wise began to reoil in their lamps because they were going down. The five foolish had said, hey, can I borrow some of yours? But the five that were wise say, there's not enough to share. And I, I need to tell you, at some times in your life, there isn't going to be enough that you're going to be able to share. 
sometimes somebody got to do something for themselves. My Bible said David encouraged himself when he was going through his situation. The men were ready to take him out. They were upset with David because they felt he was out of position. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. And sometimes you can't always share because you have just enough for you. So my Bible tells me that the five that were wise sent the five that were foolish away to go get their own. But as they were away going to buy their own oil, the Bible tells me that the bridegroom had showed up. And as the bridegroom showed up, he told them, come on in. And after everybody came in, he shut the door. And they locked it. And when the five who were foolish showed up, they began knocking on the door. But they weren't let in. He said, I don't know you. Well, do I know you? I don't know you. So we must be in position. We must be in position. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. The ones who are prepared and ready for the return will be prepared, will be rewarded. I tell you the truth. He himself will seek them, put on an apron and serve them. I'm back in Luke, y'all. As they sit and eat. The Bible says he himself will serve them because they were ready. How many of you can just picture your kids? You told them to do something. You go away. You come back. And they've done what you told them to do. As a parent, that's a mighty great feeling. Mighty great feeling. You went away and you returned and your kids did exactly what it is that you told them to do. And not only that, they did it. And when you look at what they did, you could tell that they did it out of respect. They wanted to do it. They didn't have, they didn't just have to do it, but they wanted to do it. And you could tell that they put some love into it. Coming back to this verse, the Bible says he himself will seek them, put an apron and he going to do the serving. I can remember when I was on the adjutant corps. Refresh and renewal conferences. The pastors had some good stuff, y'all. The food that they had, it was laid out. And we served. And we served. And we served. And we didn't mind serving. I see my adjutant over there smiling. He know what I'm talking about. And we served. And they didn't eat all the food. And they didn't make us do it out. So we had some of the best of the food. In the end, serving. Amen. I got somebody else in flashback mode. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn. 39th verse. But whenever he comes... He will, re he will reward the servants who are ready. We got to be ready, y'all. We got to be in position, y'all. Go to the 40th verse. The Bible says, understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burg burglar was coming, he would not per permit his house to be broken into. You must also be ready all the time for the son of man will come when least expected. Jesus is coming like a thief in the night. No man knows the hour. We just read that. No man knows the hour. In your, in your house, if you knew a thief was coming, would you not be prepared for the thief when he came? Elder Bonner had already done an intro to my message before I got up, he said, some of us still got some pistols around here. I don't think nobody's going to throw gasoline on them or nothing like that, but uh, we're going to be ready. If it were me, I know I would not have my wife at the house. 
I know I would not have my kids at the house. But I would probably be there. Because I know that he's coming. Not only that. I will already have the police there also. So when, they, when he comes in, we're already ready for him. Amen. How many of you would not do the same thing? Be prepared. Not the, maybe the exact same that I would do, but how many of you would not be prepared if you knew a thief was coming at a certain time? Amen. 41st verse. Peter asks, oh, Peter. Lord, is this illustration just for us or is it for everyone? And the Lord replied, a faithful, sensible one servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his or her, excuse me, managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. Because we're in position, because we're ready to serve, because we're faithful, because you're faithful, because you're ready to serve, because you're in position, because you're doing the things that God has called you to do. He's going to reward you. He's going to reward you greatly than what you even expecting you may expect little but he's going to give you much because of your faithfulness great is your faithfulness I'm looking around if you're an instructor in impact stand up If you have any affiliation with our team ministry, just stand up, stand up. Amen. Joyce, I'm going to ask you to stand up too. Indirectly. And I just want y'all to look around for a second. Just look around for a second. Okay. We, there, there is more, but I just want to look, I want you to look at these. Here, your teen ministry. You may be seated. Thank you. I did a sidebar there because if we go back to the scripture, a faithful servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. Being in position. If God said the next move of his next move will be in our team church, how many of you would be in position? If he said the next move is in our team church, how many of you would be in position? I don't want you to feel slighted because the other thing that God showed me also is that you don't have to have a title to be in the next move. You don't have to have have a title to be in the next move. You just need to be in position. You just need to be doing with doing what he said. I asked Joyce to stand indirectly because my spirit was touched and blessed by something my daughter said to me. Every Sunday, I would say probably the last six months to a year, could be even longer than that. When she comes to church, she always asks to go to Miss Joyce's office. Initially, I thought, okay, well, she's going to Joyce's office because everybody knows Joyce got the best candy in the church. And she keep it full. I don't care. It never runs out. It's like that river that never runs dry. I don't, I've never seen Joyce can, candy jar empty at all. Now, I'm not promoting y'all go to Joyce's office and take her candy so she has to spend more money to buy candy, but I'm just saying, okay? I've never seen Joyce's candy jar empty. So initially, 
when my daughter said, Dad, can I go to Joyce's office? Because this, is, this had been the first time that she had asked me. Previously, she was just going. So when she asked me, immediately I assumed that she was going to Joyce's office because she was going to give her some candy. And she don't have the cheap candy. She has some chocolate candy, too. But this message is not about Joyce's chocolate candy. Bring it back in. Bring it back in. Amen. So when she was going to, so I, I told her, I said, no, you're not going to Joyce's office because you just want some candy. She's like, daddy, I don't get candy when I go to Joyce's office. So I said, um, okay, naturally as a parent, I got to do my background investigation to make sure what she's saying is true. Because I know some of my other children, if that were the case, <laughs> it's going to be candy. <laughs> so I had a conversation with Joyce and what she told me, she said, this is not Shania's first time coming to my office. She always comes. She always comes to the office. We always have a conversation. And it's not about her getting food. She says, really, hardly ever does she, if she even gets candy. It's about the conversation. But I, I, I called Joyce out because she has ministered. She is ministering to her just as God is calling us to minister to other people. It's easy for Joyce to say, well, you know what? I'm not exactly over in the teen church, so I'm not going to say anything to the kid. I'm not going to be involved with the kid. It's just going to be my two and nobody else. But she puts herself in position where every Sunday she has a word that she shares with Shania. And I, I need to say this too, y'all. When she's talking to Shania, she's not sitting down quoting scripture. She's not coming saying, well, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said. There are going to be some instances that you're going to have to tell people what Jesus said. But sometimes you first have to meet the person where they're at so they can be brought up. So they would want to hear what you have to say about Jesus. And she takes this time with her every Sunday. I don't know how long she spends with Joyce. But I know Joyce has imparted something in her that she wants to go back. She wants to hear what Joyce has said. And it's not about candy. It's not about the candy. It's about what she's receiving in the conversation. She's being ministered to. Amen. Amen. Hospitality. If in the next move of God, God was saying, if he was saying, don't come to church and serve the pastors, don't come to church and serve the guests coming in or the regular members, but go to the hospital and minister there. Would we be in the move or would we miss the move? Would we be in the move or will we miss the move? I'm just asking because that's what he placed in my head. Going back to the 45th verse. But what if the servant thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, parting and getting drunk? The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. Takes me back sometimes when I was growing up. You know how mom and daddy leave you in charge? You the oldest and you got the little ones. You're going to do what I say, and if you don't do what I say, oh, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. It's coming down. I'm going to lay something down on you. But then when mom and daddy returns back home, you in trouble because you did not take the assignment the way that they gave it to you. You did not do the things that they told you to do. I see some smiles out there. Some of y'all relate to me. Annie. I ain't the only one. Okay. Amen. But because we didn't do what we were supposed to, woe came to us when the kids start telling on us. And the servant, 47th verse, who knows what the master wants, check that out, 
but the servant and the servant and a servant who knows what the master wants, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. When mom and dad came home and we didn't take care of the instructions, depending upon what it does, we were severely punished. 48. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. You know, sometimes in life we look at what's going on in the Joneses' house or what's going on in the Smiths' house. And you can go through the same thing that the Joneses or the Smiths go through, but it seems like they just get a light tap and you get beat severely. But the Bible says, much given, much is required. Much given, much is required. The Bible says that we walk not by sight, but by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Going back to Paul, regardless of what his situation, he moved forward. He did what it was that he had to do. Jesus said that he sends us out as sheep in the midst of the wolves, Matthew 10, 16. Therefore, that we are to be wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. As a Christian, I need to go back because I missed something. We need to know how to operate in God's word. Just like I was telling you about the hairdresser. She knew what she was supposed to be doing. She knew what she expected to do, but she knew that there were other things that came up. We got to know how to operate in God's word. The other thing that God gave me was he's not expecting us to be perfect. God says it's okay to make a mistake. But he says, I understand that it's okay for you to make a mistake, but you can't afford to miss me. It's okay to make a mistake, but you can't afford to miss me. You cannot afford to miss me. I need to go back to the example of the, of the linebacker. And the knowledge that I had, we talked about the linebacker knowing how to stand so he won't get knocked down every time a play is called he needs to know how to move. He has to know how he has to know the ability. He has to have the ability to stop the run. But as I actually studied after this and when I when I googled it, it said that the linebacker also has to have the right attitude. He's one of the leaders on the team. He's powerful. His presence is powerful. He has to have the ability to defeat blockers he has to get to the ball and he has to make tackles so it's more to it than him just standing there and just holding on to his man there are many different things that he needs to be able to do for the success of the football team because if he can ever get his man down then he can move on to the his his next move christians need to have the same characteristics as a linebacker. One of the things is that they have to be, have that competitive nature. The Christian has to have that competitive nature. What do you mean? Well, you got to want to see other people saved, delivered, and set free. Because Satan is coming to steal, kill, and destroy You got to want to see people saved, delivered, and set free. You got to want to be encouraged to speak a word over their life. One of the other things is that a linebacker, they say, has to be intelligent. He has to know his move and then the next move and the next move and then the next play. 
we as Christians got to know the word. We cannot afford to come in on Sunday and Sunday only, not pick up our Bible throughout the week. Wait on the pastor or a preacher to give up and give a word. We got to know it ourselves. We got to be able to minister this word to somebody else. A linebacker, they told me, has to have physical toughness. We as Christians got to have physical toughness. We got to know that when we get knocked down, we can get right back up. Get ready for the next play. Just because we're knocked down once don't mean that we're defeated. Does not mean that we're counted out. That we're dead. We got to get back up. As Christians, we got to have that leadership ability. We have to be in a position where others will follow us as we follow Christ. Others will follow us as we follow Christ. As Christians, like the linebacker, we got to have the willingness to be coached. And I could probably stay there a minute. For you see, when things going good, oh my, my, good job, good job, good job, good job. But how about when we messing up? How about when we messing up? We got to have the willingness to be coached. Hey, guess what? You, hey, Keller, you mess up. You out of position. You over here. Your wife is over here, but you over there. Why you ain't over there with your wife? What's wrong with you? Come on, y'all, talk to me. Keller, it ain't okay to steal. It ain't okay to talk about somebody all the time. Ain't okay to tell somebody it's good today and it's bad tomorrow and go talk about th that person with, th with your friend. It ain't okay to gossip, Keller. No. Ain't good to tell the people one thing, but you're doing something else. We got to have the willingness to be coached. Like the linebacker. Linebacker has to be quick coming off the line. We as Christians got to be quick. We got to be ready to fast. Ready to read the word. Oh, I got to pause there. Uh-huh. We got to be ready to fast. Ready to read the word. Ready to study. Ready, ready to meditate on the word. Ready to pray. Amen. We got to be in position. Be quick. We got to have agility. Linebacker got to have that agility. He got to be ready to move whichever way he need to go. So when he get, when he stop his man, he can move to block somebody or he can go take, some, take his opponent out. Rush the ball. Tackle the, tackle the guy with the ball. We got to be able to praise, worship, shout, dance, run, jump. See, some of us, don't have that agility because we are not physically fit naturally. We miss it spiritually, but we're not physically fit naturally. And I, we, and I used to think that if you're big, you're not physically fit. But that ain't always the case, y'all. Because I found, I'm using me personally, my own testimony, I found... When I'm out of shape, there's a lot of things that I can't do, including taking three laps around the church. And y'all look at me, Kelly, you physically fit. Yes. Yes. But I know. I know. My wife knows. My children know. But we got to have that agility just like the linebacker. We got to be quick. We got to be ready. We need to be able to move when it's time to move. Give God praise. Give him glory. Worship him. Join the dance ministry. Those ladies have some energy. I look at some of y'all shout from time to time and I'm like, my God, my God, God never gave me a shout. 
And y'all, I want to shout so bad. I look at the mothers over the church and they be getting it. Oh, Lord, they be getting it. And the times that I remember shouting when God took over, I was like, oh, my God, please stop. Stop. God, I'm tired. I'm tired. And it's one thing when your arms start moving and your legs start moving and when God takes control and you just want to stop and you can't stop and you really realize that you are not where you are supposed to be. You are not as physically fit as you should be. <laughs> My God. And we have to have strength. Just like the, the linebacker has strength, we have to have strength. We have to have power. We have to have a presence. Because our Christian walk is not a day. It's not a minute. It's not an hour. It's not a second. It's a lifelong commitment. Lifelong journey. It's for life. So we have to have the strength so we can endure. Amen. 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 I told you God gave me two things, right? The first one was position. The last one was image. And he only gave me one thing. So I'm getting ready to close. He said, so others can see him in us and want to be changed and reflect God's image. He said, we have to have the image of God. So others can see him in us and desire to change. Not only desire to change, but to reflect God's image. We have to be disciples of the word of God. If we're going to be ready for the next move, we have to be disciples. I used impact a few minutes ago, but think of this. If God came and he took all of us over 40 out to be with him, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. If we never taught anybody else, if we never shared the word, what's going to happen to the next generation? I talked about Miss Joyce ministering to my daughter. Not that we don't minister to her. But it's good that she's taking that time to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to share with you. Who better else than somebody else who has the love of Christ? I'd rather her from Minister Joyce than the dope dealer on the street. Than the prostitute. Because at least I know she, if she steps outside the will of God, Joyce is going to check her. And we as Christians, this is what we're charged to do. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. But we're to impart into others as we're following Christ so they can not only want to follow Christ, but they can also reflect that same image of Christ. Amen. Luke 644 says, for every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns, thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. For every tree is known by its own fruit. Will you be ready for the next move of God? Will you be ready for the next move of God? Will we be ready for the next move of God? Will I be ready for the next move of God? And we're standing. And we're standing. If you're not saved, I'm going to invite you to the altar today. Because if you're going to be ready for the next move, 
then you first have to give your life to Christ. If you're not saved, I'm going to ask that you come to the altar. Amen. Amen. My brothers, I'm going to ask you all to come to the altar this morning. Every brother in the house, I'm going to ask you to come to the altar.